So, 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 before today's lesson, I thought I'd let you know I spoke to a friend about the uh, the uh, concerning gunpowder scenes in the story of the Kelly gang from the previous episode. And they actually told me that movies back in the day would load up gun barrels with baby powder to give it that wild burst we see in the films during the shootouts. Pretty cool, but uh, still very unsafe to do since this can mess with the condition of the gun causing backfires and hot powder spurting out and getting on the hands and face. This friend that I spoke with is my old housemate, who I spoke with tangentially about the topic of creation versus criticism. We recorded that chat, and it's available on my page as the first episode of a new series called A Chat With, where I'll be talking with some friends about various media-related topics. We didn't talk about the baby slash gun powder in this episode, but we did talk about Viggo Mortensen's toe. Seriously though, it was a really fun conversation, and I'm looking forward to doing more of them, so... It's there if you want to check it out. So, no, they weren't actually shooting at each other in the story of the Kelly Gang. I'm sorry if I gave that impression. Still, I don't think either should be recommended shoot bullets at the gun range in a safe environment and never, ever load up a gun with baby powder. This has been Gun Safety with an Australian who has never shot a gun in his life. The Castle is the most Australian thing that I have ever seen. A movie that I think sets the gold standard for our country's specific brand of comedy, like Taika Waititi's films for New Zealand, Monty Python for Britain, or Zack Snyder for America. The castle follows the Kerrigan family living at Three Highview Crescent Coolaroo, and they're battling it out with airport developers who are forcing them out of their home along with their neighbours thanks to compulsory acquisition laws to extend the runway situated behind their house. Compulsory acquisition is essentially when the government or a government authority granted body purchases property from the inhabitants who must comply with the acquisition. The inhabitants and anyone else affected are expected to be compensated and the amount offered can vary. Sometimes though this can be challenged and the amount offered can be further negotiated or exemptions can be allowed, as we see in action with this film. Using the tried and true Aussie method of get stuffed, patriarch Daryl Kerrigan, played by Michael Keaton, mounts a legal defence to keep his and his family's beloved home. The title plays off the old adage of a man's house is his castle, the sanctuary of the Aussie battler, their pride and joy, the Australian dream. Daryl values the little things, strange knickknacks of life, obscure little tchotchkes like paddle boat rollers, the absolute best of the best are kept on display in his pool room, a museum of his life. He finds meaning in anything and everything, the great and the small. He's a bogan hipster. Since you're watching my content and you've listened to me talk, I'm assuming you know what a hipster is. But a bogan is essentially an Australian redneck. Well, um, I mean, yeah, pretty much. The film was written by members of Working Dog Productions, a Melbourne-based TV and film production company. You may recognise names like Tom Gleisner, Jane Kennedy, comedians who were there around when ABC was still funny. The crew were well known for satirising elements of Australian culture before with their show Frontline, which made fun of Australian news programmes. This was their first go at film, but they had plenty of TV programmes under their belt before this. This is one of only three movies that Working Dog Productions has made. Was it that successful yet sincere depiction of Australian working class culture that they wanted it to be? Well, first let's have a look at the film setup. The Castle was released in the year of my birth, 1997, and it was filmed on a budget of $750,000 on location in my backyard. Legitimately, I live just a few k's from Brunswick, Essendon Fields, and Strathmore, where the film was shot over the course of 11 to 12 days. They also filmed in Canberra for the high court scenes, and of course, who can forget the serene serenity of Bonnie Doon, which makes a glorious appearance as the Kerrigan's holiday home getaway. Having less than a fortnight of filming really shows on the production side of things. Angles and motions are pretty amateur and stock standard, just put in the most practical make sure they can see what's going on sort of framing. But this actually kind of aids the film's working class atmosphere. Very DIY and personal. Where this movie truly excels though is the acting and dialogue. It comes across so off the cuff, stream of consciousness, in the moment with every actor cast perfectly for their role. Caton as Daryl and Charles Tingwell as Kerrigan's barrister Lawrence Hamill in particular. The characters are certainly set up as stereotypes, but they become extremely endearing as the film goes on. Some of the characters don't have direct involvement in the plots, despite taking up a fair chunk of the screen time, but, but they do aid the familial community vibe of the film, and they each find their own place within it, for reasons I'll talk about in a bit. The movie made a pretty admirable $10 million at the Australian and New Zealand box offices, 
where it was exclusively released in theatres. While it has aired on American TV, I imagine it wasn't released outside of Australia and New Zealand because the potential costs of distributing it would have exceeded the returns. Funnily enough, the American TV version changed a few things to appeal to states lingo and make sense to the Yanks. The Australian delicatessen of Rissoles is referred to as meatloaf, the petrol and oil mixture of Two Stroke became diesel, and Hey Hey It's Saturday turned into Funniest Home Videos since Australia already had their own version of it. Whilst British and more recently New Zealand comedy have breached the mainstream, there isn't as much broad appeal with something like The Castle I'd say. Like, I found it very charming and funny, but it does feel like you have to be in on it, being an Australian or knowing someone from or a bunch about Australia. It's very niche, but at home it is regarded as one of the best Australian movies ever made, encapsulating the Australian larrikin spirit. Suffering your jock. So enough fart assing about, let's talk about The Castle. The film opens up on this lovely chap named Dale. He is Daryl's youngest child and narrates the film. The framing device of the story is Dale's retelling of events. This gives the first quarter of the movie a sort of documentary feel, exploring the ins and outs of the Kerrigan clan. The whole my story angle kind of plays into the Aussie battler edge, the honest Joe telling it like it is, my truth, my life. We then get a shot of the castle itself, a quaint suburban home that kind of looks like it could be on the front cover of Triple J's album of the week. The Kerrigans have had the place for 15 years, meaning Dale must be 10 years old. The home, as mentioned, is right next to the airport, hence why the Kerrigans were able to get it for a steal. I love that, just how the airport barely plays into the story. It's just such a, yep, there it is. How yeah, cool, right there whenever you need it. It's probably most certainly not just an Australian thing, but knowing people who have a thing about their homes makes it more Australian to me. Like if you go over to a mate's place and they have a creek in their backyard, a huge reserve, a cemetery, just a thing that makes the house its own character. Like I used to live in essentially what was a terrace house engineer's cottage that was just in the middle of this reserve with this tiny little fence, it's such a weirdly situated place, but has a lot of character. Ladies and gentlemen, our hero, in his lumberjack shirt just watering the garden. I do not think you could have picked a more perfect shot to establish this character. In the most casual of casual attire, doing a task that many considered to be mundane, Dale's voiceover tells us how Daryl can't figure out how he got the house for so cheap, but then immediately talks about how the house was originally going to be part of a major housing development until the planes and power lines put people off according to the real estate. As if the two topics are just completely unrelated, the property value versus the lack of interest due to noise pollution and eyesores. He's just too optimistic and puts his wits elsewhere. Whilst others may feel that the noise is polluted or the sights saw the eyes, Daryl loves both the power lines and the airport. He considers them both pillars of man's ingenuity and ability. What's really cool to see is that Dale and the rest of the family love that about him. He's completely flipped pretentiousness on its head. He builds pool tables and has extensions that that overlap and don't always come to fruition because his synapses are firing off like Sydney Harbour on New Year's Eve. Pre-2020, Daryl is a tow truck driver, one of the best in the game according to Dale. And fun fact, the Kerrigan family was given that name in the script because there was a tow truck company in Melbourne already called Kerrigans. That's their tow truck. We are then introduced to Daryl's wife Sal. She keeps the family together, Dale tells us. She makes arts and crafts and Daryl is amazed at her work. She made a box with ducks on it. You could put things in that. This thing at the end of the table is Steve, the second eldest Kerrigan child. He likes to buy weird things. Ergonomic chairs. It's actually kind of funny looking at the contrast between Steve and his dad, the generational leap of admiring these fanciful knickknacks. Daryl finds value in the gifts and creations that he receives. Steve sees it as more of a sport and apparently can haggle very well. Like his father, he does make things. However, they are more gimmicky Kramer level inventions like a motorbike helmet with a brake light on it, which is just so... Actually, not a bad idea. Like sometimes a motorcyclist helmet is more visible than the back of the bike. That's not a bad one, Steve. He also made a hose with a broom on the end of it, which Daryl uses to clean his boat, the Sea Lady. This device is in fact an Australian artifact. Uh, my dad had one, and we fully claim ownership. Of the other two Kerrigan children are Tracy and Wayne. Tracy is a hairdresser and the only Kerrigan to attain a tertiary education, which Daryl is beyond proud of. She just married Incredible Hulk number one, Con, kickboxing extraordinaire and accountant. At the wedding, Daryl gives a beautiful speech and is welcomed into the family as an honorary Western Oriental gentle person. Wayne, on the other hand, is in prison for armed robbery, but Daryl and the rest of the family love him still just the same. He is a bit of a black sheep, according to Dale himself. The family seem a bit uncomfortable to talk about him, but 
won't shy away from telling them how it's all ancient history. They just want Wayne to be able to move on and they, they know he's a good bloke at heart who just got wrapped up in the wrong crowd. Dale goes to visit him every Friday where they talk extensively about digging holes. There are other points in the film where there's a lot of elation and happiness and Dale wishes that Wayne could be there to experience it. The prison that Wayne resides in is Her Majesty's Prison Pentridge, the College of Knowledge in Coburg. The prison itself actually closed only a month after the cast released in 97. Now it is a huge housing development with a shopping center right in the middle of the old prison grounds. It was there where my housemate and I went to see Spider-Man No Way Home. Also in the house are these... <clears throat> Sorry. Greyhounds that Daryl used to race on track because nobody's perfect. These beautiful creatures are the main reason Daryl and Sal got together and we'll chat about that later. Yeah, that's the Kerrigans. A small family with a huge heart. You wouldn't want to mess with their lot in life. Unless you're a government sanctioned airport development authority. The inciting incident, or at least the inciting inciter, is this skeevy dude dropping by the house one day, telling Daryl he's doing a sort of routine valuation of the land, but doesn't give him the full picture around the visit. However, Daryl is an honest man, and unfortunately, it was pretty easy for this bold Judas to take advantage of him in this situation. The rotund man with the shiny head asks about different assets around the property and recognizes very quickly the airport runway's close proximity to the house, which does factor into the valuation. I can imagine this guy would go back to the developers like, yeah, it is that close to the house. We could drop the offer a couple thousand. He then squeezes out of Daryl that the soil is full of lead using master manipulations. What do you know about lead? So yeah, essentially he is just here to give an estimate to the developers so they can kick them out accurately. We see this with the different amounts offered to the neighbours when a week or so the letter finally comes. They are laying siege to the castle. The family then get a visit from this wonderful man by the name of Farouk, one of their next door neighbours. Farouk has also received one of these kick out notices. What I really like is that as soon as he sees the other neighbours are getting hit with these notices, he immediately runs to the old man next door named Jack. There's an obvious sense of care for this bloke. He has no family in the area and the house is the only thing he's got. A huge slap in the face to Highview Crescent. So Daryl marches down to Moreland City Council to tell the desk clerk, nah yeah, yeah nah. I had absolutely no idea that this building was used for anything else beyond graffiti canvas. Unfortunately, it doesn't go Daryl's way. The desk clerk pretends to relate to Daryl, but he just asks her to give it to him straight. I love Daryl's recourse, it's just, it's my house, my home. What do you think you're doing? No way. Since the clerk is a little bit British, this is a compulsory acquisition. And everyone who is an antagonist in this, funnily enough, is a little bit British, it falls on deaf ears. Daryl steps out of the council building, defeated. And Paul Kelly kicks in because Paul Kelly, when you're down and out, goes hand in hand with depressed working class Australians. For anyone who doesn't know or has no taste, Paul Kelly is essentially Bob Dylan but Australian and better. Kelly wrote the best Christmas song of all time and is well respected within Australian music history. Daryl then goes for a walk down the street with his film. The dogs disappear after the next shot. I hope he didn't leave them in the car, otherwise he has been thoroughly character assassinated. I know this is kind of an argument for adaptation, but it feels like there should be more than three signs for cigarettes on Sydney Road. Daryl turns to plan B. Dennis Denuto Esquire, small time lawyer about to get the case of his life going up against federal authority. He is understandably hesitant. If you are interested in Dennis's legal resume, you should know that he defended Wayne and... Well, though Daryl points out that Wayne actually had robbed the petrol station, whereas the Kerrigans and the neighbors haven't done anything wrong. No beating around the bush with Daryl Kerrigan. He isn't unreasonable. The guy certainly isn't a speak to the manager type. He knows his son did wrong and notes Dennis's defense of Wayne as him doing his best. Daryl really is about justice. Back at the castle, Daryl keeps his spirits high, telling exciting towing stories. He's still marveling at his wife's cooking and enjoying Hey Hey at Saturday. Dale starts thinking about Wayne again, alone in prison and thinking about how much he must miss home. I'm not too sure what to comment on in terms of Dale's potential guilt, but I do think there's an element here of the house needing to stay so that Wayne can come home and the family can really get back together and complete this whole picture, and that it remains incomplete without Wayne. The idea of moving when he's missed eight of the 15 years at home is a slap in the face for the Kerrigans. I don't have any doubt that these little things about the characters, the relationships that don't necessarily pertain to the overarching plot, are there to give us more motivation for Daryl to keep the house. This is the forever home, the Kerrigans Hobbiton that none of them, especially Dale or Daryl, want Wayne to miss out on. Notice how in these moments of bliss, the calm and confident Kerrigans practice their little hobbies with more ease. 
As things get sour later on, we'll notice that effort feels a little bit more strained. In some cases, they'll fight through, in others, there's really nothing else to do but wallow. But for now, things are chill. Con and Tracy are coming back from their honeymoon in Thailand, and then the Kerrigans are heading up to Bonny Doon. Bonny Doon is a lovely little village a couple hours out from Melbourne near Mansfield. A beautiful valley vista with a fantastic lake, isolated from the drama of the outside world. A great fishing, camping, and boating site. So the Kerrigans pick Con and Tracy up from the airport, and you may immediately realise that all they have to do is walk home. Dale himself points this out over a montage with some slick tunes. Though honestly, I think it would have been funnier if they just showed us their walking and have the music play over like it does without commentary. Then you can recognise yourself, oh yeah right, all they have to do is walk home. Still gave me a hearty chuckle and it is pretty funny that they stole an airport trolley. After the mini montage, we linger on a shot of Daryl's boat. And I thought the reason for highlighting the boat was because the family may have to sell it or put it down for a legal defense later. But yeah, it's just, there's the boat. I think it's in the movie for the same reason as the Kerrigan's chimney. Charm. That's a bit of charm. Inside, Tracy and Con talk all about their trip and Dale tries to get Eric Banner to hulk out. <laughs> Trace and Con then share some presents with the fam. Daryl gets a samurai sword letter opener that goes straight to the pool room. Sal gets a genuine Rolex that they got off the beach in Thailand for $15. Hey, maybe they have Steve's amazing haggle abilities. Decades passed and now it is time for Bonnie Doon. We get the first musical number of the film. Where? Yeah. Going to Barney Doon. The Kerrigans have a beautiful holiday home built by Daryl with a fantastic view of the power lines. Daryl tells Dale he reckons they're the luckiest family in the world. You gotta love this man's optimism, even when the house is on the line. Truly, it does remind me of the Australian method of getting something done. Declaring victory on step one. The next morning, the sea lady shows us its remarkable ability to be silent when not in frame. Daryl, Dale and Steve go fishing while Tracy bleaches Sal's hair. The house is on everyone's mind, but they're trying not to let it kill the vibe. Cut to Eric Banner. This dog seems to be able to sense some ugly green-eyed monster within him. Notice when we see Steve rock up from having collected a chicken coop from an undisguised location, we see that his motorcycle helmet has the headlight on the back of it. The castle officially does continuity better than Disney Star Wars. So based on the importance of the Bonnie Doon holiday house shown within this sequence, part of me thought there'd be something about the Kerrigans losing the case at the end of the film and that they'd have to move out to Bonnie Doon or that the airport would get desperate and burn the house down so they get forced to move. I'm a, I'm a very glass half full kind of guy. As it stands, this is more of a reprieve for the characters this whole sequence, more of a calm before the storm, but we still get plenty of character work. Like when Daryl has a moment where he admits to Sal he wishes that Wayne could be there and that Daryl could have done better. This is a pretty heavy moment, but it's treated with some kind of casual realism that I very much appreciated. It's a rare moment of Daryl showing some fragility. With everything going on with the house, it's clear that the idea of moving out is even worsened by his son not being there. It seems that Daryl feels as though he failed to keep his son out of prison and is now faced with the prospect of the home getting booked as well. Not if he has anything to say about it. The trip to Bonnie Doon is capped off with Daryl committing a hate crime against Steak. Menace the Dennis gets Daryl a hearing at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Now it is time for round two of Daryl Kerrigan versus The Man. Sporting a a tie on top of the same outfit he wore to his first radio, Daryl pleads his case. The judge at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is more British than the clerk from earlier. This makes him more evil. Daryl doesn't have much of a case, but he argues for good sense and brings up the constitution. He's got the spirit. He shows an awareness of right and fair, not always being clear as day, but that isn't the case with Airlink trying to take his house and his neighbors. Oh yeah, Farouk. Farouk is here for moral support and I think he is doing a fantastic job. Daryl's speech is very impassioned and he uses a lot of phrases and arguments that'll come up later in the film, but unfortunately the court rules in favour of the developers. While he may have the moral argument, Daryl just doesn't have the legal angle. At least, for now. Back at home, Daryl tells everyone about the verdict and remarks on how he feels that he let everybody in the neighborhood down. This is building on a similar feeling that he had toward the outcome of Wayne's case. Daryl may not see the scenario as a second chance, but we can recognize the parallels and I think he may be able to see them as well. Still, the neighbors really appreciate what Daryl is doing here. He is sticking his neck out, ruffling the feathers of federal authority. And so, Daryl is not ready to give in and decides it's time to bring out the big guns. Ergonomic. This scene sets up that Dennis is not a part of the machine and will very happily fight it. 
well, Daryl just wanted Dennis to recommend another barrister. But since nobody else wants it, dear Dennis may not be very sure in his abilities, but Daryl gives him a rousing speech, and so Dennis takes the case. Things are a little bit tense at home now since the legalities are ramping up and Daryl is a bit unsure about the future of the house. He comes across more stern and stressed out in his conversation with Tracy, but he still engages with Steve's wasteful spending and jokingly suggests sending a hairdressing photo of Tracy to Channel 9. Father and daughter have a laugh together. Things aren't perfectly serene right now, but efforts are still being made by everybody to keep spirits high. Nothing's going to be achieved by acting all doom and gloom. Cut back to the office of Mr. Denuto, who is burning the midnight oil work his legal magic. He looks a little stressed out. In an indiscriminate amount of time later, a letter from the office of Denuto Dennis is received by Hammersley and Laylock, the law firm representing Airlink. And of course the villains are stationed on Queen Street. One fade out later and then we're back on Sydney Road, this time with some dude who looks like a Channel 9 newsreader holding some documents. I actually thought this guy was just an extra at first, but this is our bad guy, or one of them at least. Ron Graham. He's with Hammersley and Laylock, and he's here to visit the opposing counsel. We could see him chuckle to himself when he spies Dennis's law firm. I think it was important to show us the building for Hammersley and Laylock to get that contrast between these two buildings. I think that we can gauge that Graham sees Dennis as someone not to be taken seriously. Little did he know that Daryl and Dennis would refuse the $25,000 increase on the original offer for the house, and also be unswayed by his thinly veiled threats. Returning to Highview Crescent, again the mood's dour and Daryl Daryl's trying to keep things up, but it's really starting to weigh on him. He's a confident and assured man, but he doubts himself sometimes. He doesn't want his family or neighbours to get hurt or cause any wayward drama, but he is assured by Sal that he did the right thing rejecting that money, and that it shouldn't be the decider. To liven up the mood, Sal tells the story of how she and Daryl met. Sal's partner at the time took her to the Greyhound races. How romantic. While Sal went off by herself to get some drinks or something, she ran into Daryl. The two got to talking and eventually he asked her out onto a date. And when Sal informed him that she was already on a date, he backed off and wished her well like a gentleman. Sal took one look at him and said, Now that's a principled man. He won't take me on dates to the Greyhounds. This riveting tale cheers up Dazza. I really like how this scene cements Daryl as principled in the eyes of others. Considering all the responsibility that's been heaved onto his shoulders, it'd be normal for anyone to doubt themselves in these moments. But here's Sal telling Daryl, That principle is what I love about you. Sal is my favourite character. With a knock at the door, we begin the best scene of the film. Guy Fieri, but make it Australian, threatens Daryl on behalf of Airlink. Corruption, intimidation, this just got a lot more spicy. Daryl's having none of it, but the other Guy Fieri tries to strong arm him. Steve is armed too. I just love how this goes from 2 to 11 in intensity. Straight after we have a lovely story of Daryl and Sal's first meeting, we have Daryl and Son dealing with hired thugs at the door. Daryl looks like he's bonnied in his dunes. They send the wannabe chopper raid on his way. Daryl gets upset with Steve because he said no more guns in the house after Wayne. But quickly the conversation turns into he and Steve's whole thing. Yeah. How much? Some monies. What were they asking? More than that. You little ripper. Later that night, Thug McThugson throws a rock into Steve's car, waking the peacefully sleeping family. Since Daryl knows justice, he swears vengeance. He and Steve roll up to the mansion of one of the Airlink pricks in Turak for a covert get stuffed operation. After a brief altercation at the intercom where Daryl tells his son that calmness is the way, they pull the mansion's gate down with their tow truck. An eye for an eye, a fancy iron gate for a windshield. Justice. The next morning, a federal officer of the law rocks up and asks Daryl if he's seen any iron gates running about. At first, it seems like he's done for, but Officer Mick and Daryl go way back. Mick's just there to warn Daryl that these Airlink guys are serious, and he's better off fighting this matter in court. Considering the Kerrigans have been here for 15 years, there's a huge community vibe to the neighbourhood, and Wayne's had a run-in with the law, it makes sense that they know this officer by name. Maybe Mick even said, I'll go speak with the suspect, when he was debriefed about the complaint. He has a keen awareness of the situation and seems to be looking out for Daryl more than anything. Mick tells Daryl to hide the unfortunately timed new purchase of the lovely iron gates at the front of his house. Just so the recently bereaved of gates Turak man in the mansion doesn't get jealous. Next scene is a strategy meeting with all the neighbourhood. Daryl, Jack, Farouk and Yvonne. Turns out the thug from last night has been making the rounds. Farouk used the man's bigotry against him. My friend come to your house. Put bomb under your car and blow you. Ergonomic. Guy, get scared and leave. I don't really hear from it like this, but you know, I'm Arab and people think all Arab have bomb. Exposing the inherent prejudice of criminals hired to intimidate innocent people. Hillview Crescent forms some kind of a fellowship squad, and Dennis represents them all in federal court. All he has to do is prove the actions of Airlink have been unconstitutional. 
I'm thinking threats, damage to property, intimidation, yada yada yada, crime 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 are all pretty unconstitutional, but considering the nature of Australia's constitution relates to the parameters of local, state, federal and the accompanying judicial laws, we won't be looking at how this action infringes on rights and freedoms, more how it breaks the law itself. Sounds easy enough. Bring it on, Dennis. Um, all, all right, G give me one moment. And I, and I will. Up against slightly British villain number three. Why does this movie hate palms? Dennis highlights utter, incredulous, inconceivable, reckless abandonment and complete disregard of the vibe of the constitution. Of the Commonwealth of Australia. I love that he added in the Commonwealth part as he was reading the front cover. Maybe to match Ron's regurgitation of legal mumbo jumbo. Maybe the villains all being vaguely British and the emphasis on the whole Commonwealth aspect of the constitution is a commentary on Britain's establishment of the Australian colony, and how the systems put in place favour the big kahuna like Air Link and not the small tacker like Mr. Kerrigan. Dennis is dishevelled and stressed and tired and stressed, but he confidently asserts the constitution's breach. Only to have this mean person ask which section, because I guess we have to get into specifics. Whatever happened to taking someone at their word, your honourableness? Alright, I gotta be honest, I feel like I'm not really doing this scene much justice, so before I ruin anything else, all I'll says is watch it for your beautiful self. If not the whole movie, at least this scene. It's fantastic. And I also want to mention that Farouk is there. Also, also, I will say that the Eddie Marbury case gets mentioned in Dennis's speech as well, and it's a very interesting case that I'd recommend everyone have a look at. It's about the recognition of indigenous land rights prior to colonisation, and it takes a look at a different angle of this same principle looked at in the castle albeit in a very different context. During the proceedings, an adjournment is called. On the topic of little character things getting reincorporated despite not relating to the overall plot, at the start of the film, Wayne gifted Daryl an ashtray, despite him saying he doesn't smoke. Now at the courthouse, Daryl lights up some death sticks during the adjournment. Either Daryl's been fibbing us this whole time and this is something he does in private, or the stress has gotten too high for the case and he's picked up smoking. Those air link assholes are chipping away at his purity. Thankfully, this is the only blight on his character. That and the way he cooks steak. Whilst prematurely enjoying his celebratory cigarette, Daryl meets a man named Lawrence, who has a voice like a free-flowing fountain of dark chocolate and the face and smile of a basket full of sleeping puppies and kittens. He and Daryl have a chat. Daryl talks about the government wanting to take his house and Laurie talks about how he is spectating his son in court today. From that line, I assumed that it would have been revealed that his son was the extra from Home and Away and that Laurie would be the one to have a heart and go up against his corrupt and conniving son. This look Lawrence gives when he learns of the case seemed to imply some guilt. Like most of my recent predictions, that turned out to be absolute naff. Cause you see, Laurie is a barrister too. A pretty big one actually, a QC which is Queen's Council. Queen's Council, or Senior Council, refers to a senior barrister whose skills have become recognised by the Supreme Court and the legal profession after a number of years of work and are given the honorary title of QC or SC, becoming a barrister Victoria. <coughs> Basically, they get to wear the fancy hair pieces. Laurie is actually retired though. Retired, but still able to come out and practice law whenever he wants. I'm not sure on the whole process of that, but there you go. Some could say it's a bit convenient, Laurie and Daryl's meeting, considering how integral Laurie is to the film's final act. I'd say if you take into account Daryl's friendly disposition and the fact that if he was going to speak to anybody around here, they'd likely be a lawyer or other some such, it's not impossible. But it is certainly lucky that they happen to be a Queen's Council member, and this happened to be his son's first appearance. Certainly convenient, but not a hole in the film's logic by any means. I wish he found his way into the story through more natural means. Laurie agrees that Daryl's case is outrageous and looks to gain some more knowledge about the case. He shows genuine concern with the matter and the fact that in something as serious as this, Daryl is represented by Dennis, someone Laurie has never heard of. Being a QC, you can imagine Laurie's pretty familiar with litigators on federal matters, probably knowing most by name. The two part ways and the verdict is read. Unfortunately, the judge gives Dennis a vibe check. This judge was a lot more reasonable than the last dude, but unfortunately they have to follow all this law stuff. We see Daryl having to break the bad news. Dale recounts how telling Jack was the hardest for Daryl. What we've seen here is that because of Jack's situation, Daryl had taken it upon himself to look out for him. The fact that he's older, living alone and has no family nearby, the unwavering principle of Daryl Kerrigan recognises the hard spot this sweet old man is in and puts it upon himself to fight for him. This shows Daryl's unwillingness to let others get dragged down by something that he has the ability to stop. He has the means to at least put up a challenge, and put up a challenge he does. We then cut to Tracy and Con trying to cheer him up. And thus we begin Con's character arc. Can I just say, and this is 
At dinner, the weight has become too much for Daryl to carry. Can't put on the same face he usually does for his family. And they all try to bolster the mood by bringing in their usual traditions we've seen throughout the film. Complimenting Sal's cooking, or getting into Steve's next exorbitant purchase, but it doesn't work. All they can do is talk about the next move in the acquisition. They've got to be out in two weeks. Daryl admits that he hasn't told Wayne. The person he feels he's let down most is about to be let down again in Daryl's mind. But when Dale goes to see Wayne so that he can be the one to tell him, Wayne is shattered but wants the family, especially Daryl, to know the only reason he loved the house so much is that his family were the ones in it. Think about how the first thing Wayne asks when he's told that they're losing the house is if dad is alright. All he wants is for them to be safe and happy. Wayne even has Dale write a letter to his dad to let him know that. And tells him what the lawyers and government can get. Now, all those lawyers and government people can just go and get. And all those lawyers and government people can go and get. Ergonomic. Dale reads it to Daryl as he is packing up the pool room. A very deliberate choice of room to set this scene in. Daryl really does seem to appreciate it, but gets straight back to packing. He looks around at his most treasured possessions, taking it all in. He takes a photo of the whole family off the wall to admire. It's clear that Wayne's words have rung true for Daryl. Whether or not Daryl knows it, he's done a fantastic job of keeping the relationship strong within the family and wants that stability to keep maintained in a secure and charming home. Steve comes in to also hammer home the fighting spirit of Daryl Kerrigan and how his family also appreciates that part of him. This tiny interaction with Steve not knowing the opposite of letting someone down is my favourite interaction of the film. It's the message to a T and seals the strength of the character writing. They may not have all the words for it, but they can still tell them how it is. Remember that bit for later. Sal comes in with some documents that Daryl needs to sign. However, he can't because he is the most principled man in Australia. Him wanting to keep that principle to keep this house is the closest thing you can say to this man being selfish. But he's more than earned that for how hard he's fought to keep everyone afloat as well. He wants them to share in his spoils and is more than willing to give up a part of himself for the betterment of others. It's a huge contrast between the humble man who gives all he can for his community versus the greedy government authority that wants to take with no consideration for the people they're affecting. Something else that I noticed in this scene, it's something they can it's pointed out to us pretty abundantly clear in the first scene pretty much, but it's a bit more subtle here and also shows us how Daryl's character remains uncompromised despite being beaten down. And that's how he doesn't react at all to the plane flying overhead. He doesn't mind them and even appreciates them and the power lines for what they represent for human achievement. I find it interesting in that you could see the airport wanting to expand and take Daryl's home is an example of how the human achievement is being used against him. Multiple times he and Dennis get told this is a huge operation you're interfering with. But his response is always, if you're gonna expend your grand achievement, that's fantastic. But don't mess with what I've been able to achieve. The castle, as much as any airport runway or power line, is a testament to human achievement. So, in the darkest depths of the second act low point when all seems lost and our heroes cry out in despair for help, as hopeless as it may seem, Lawrence comes in to save the ergonomic day. This angel in the shape of a man tells Daryl that his speciality was constitutional law. So yeah, add that to the tally of convenience that Lawrence showed up when he did. If he didn't, this whole rest of the story wouldn't be able to happen, but I am glad he is here. He believes Daryl may have a case and wants to represent him at no cost. And Daryl seems much more excitable and in better spirits as this new development develops. Three weeks later, the dream team of Daryl, Laurie and Dennis hit up the High Court in Canberra, ready to tell the hoity-toits where to shove it. It's funny how Dennis has gone from small claims lawyer in Brunswick to the instructing solicitor of a QC in the High Court of Australia. We see he's even able to properly identify sections of the constitution now, vibing to the Roman numerals. Lawrence stands up and gives the case. Essentially it's the same argument as Daryl, the same principle of justice and right to it, but Laurie has a special way with words and cites references a little bit better. This is interesting to think about how the Kerrigans didn't know the words but got across how much they cared for each other and meant to one another. How the house is a basis for all that caring and meaning and now Laurie is communicating all of that to the judge. Of course Laurie would be good at this. It's in his name. Yay. We get this fantastic joke. Your Honor, my client built his home by the law in full accordance with the law. He doesn't know about the extensions. I love how these little seeds that seemed irrelevant to the story earlier on are brought back to strengthen these characters and add a broader sense of world and environment to the story. Good stuff. The lawyers representing the flying machines are led by another mean, sort of British person. Now I must say this rampant bigotry on the part of the castle is a bit distracting, but I think I read a crikey article that says we're allowed to be racist to Britain. Now Dimwit says a mean thing that I don't think would fly in a court case. Dwelling, or as it might more accurately be called, 
eyesore. What are you calling an eyesore? It's called a home, you dickhead. To be fair, I don't think that Daryl's outburst would as well, but not only is this poor form, but I don't know how a lawyer of this man's esteem, I assume he has esteem due to his complete lack of it, would be called into question, maybe even contempt for trying to misdirect the case and colour the judge's verdict with irrelevant information. Irrelevant and inflammatory. I'm not a legal man, so I could be dead wrong, but I don't know if the court would be okay with this. They do tell both of them off and call an adjournment, but would more follow on from this? Comment below if you're more smarter than me. In the adjournment, Daryl comments on the hoity-toitness of the hoity-toit. He recognises these snooty pricks are unable to look past the railing on their ivory towers to see the value the Kerrigans put in the small things. This leads to Daryl uttering a phrase we heard earlier. It's not a house, it's a home. Laurie takes note of that and uses those words verbatim minus the swearing, in his closing statement. Despite being the one to communicate things better, Laurie uses Daryl's words because that's the entire argument, the emotional opening statement header to the page of the argument that a legal case would be robotic and not nearly as persuasive without. The laws have been quoted, interpreted, and justifiably applied by Laurie, but we need to include why we have this in the first place. We have decided in our laws to recognise on just terms. It's not just a criteria sheet that manifested in nature. Humans built this idea. This law to make sure no one gets treated unfairly. Well, maybe that's up for debate, but that's at least what it should be, right? Otherwise, what separates us from an unthinking, survival instinct-only parasite? This is the minutia of have a heart, be fair, and Laurie argues it with precision. And, uh, okay, a couple things as well. Sorry to ruin the mood, this isn't necessarily a criticism, just an observation. I thought that at some point in the court case they'd bring up the fact that Airlink valuated the property under deceptive circumstances and that they threatened the family twice and damaged their property. Honestly, I think it would have helped their case. Perhaps it was because of the lack of evidence, but I still would have liked to have some acknowledgement of Airlink's more obvious shifty behaviour. The focus of the case was, of course, the matter of just terms. But still, it would have been cool to see that story beat pay off in another way beyond isolated drama and comedy. To see the toity hoities on the other side act all, oh, well, we had no idea that that was going on. You know, they don't think about all this terrible stuff that they're hiring other people to do. Instead, the focus, like I said, is on the Just Terms thing, and they pull that off really well. I was actually thinking about how cool this would be as a stage play, like a sort of minimal set thing that, uh, involves all of these situations and has some really cool set pieces that expand on the lore of the castle. Well, the lore and the lore. I know we're all sick of recreating things in different formats, like kind of remakes of uh, classic animated movies and live action, that sort of thing, but they can always be done well, so I could definitely see that happening with a stage play of the castle. So, yeah. Right, holders, if you're listening, it's my idea, but you may steal it. And so, by the court's decree, the airport can go and get stuffed. We won. We won. You little ripper! Daryl is elated. I have never been happier to see someone smile. And Dennis thinks about how good this is going to look on his CV. Daryl makes peace with QC Dimwit. All right. Bad luck. The case gets national attention on the news. Dowell throws a huge party, inviting all of the amazing characters that we've met along the way. Con completes his character arc. Comedian Tony Martin rocks up for two seconds as Laurie's son. This spiritually connects the castle to another cornerstone of Australian culture, Tism. The case outcome becomes known as the Kerrigan decision, and a string of well-deserved good fortune comes to the family and their friends. Wayne gets out of prison on parole thanks to the help of Laurie. Dennis becomes a big hotshot lawyer with a fancy new printer, sellout. And Daryl finishes the patio extension, making it Greek as a tribute to the Croatian-German actor Eric Banner. Steve gets back together with an old girlfriend, and they have a baby to satiate his spending habits. Wayne joins Daryl in the towing business, which is now booming thanks to the case coverage. Tracy and Con have a kid, and they train him in the way of the fist. And Laurie becomes a good friend to Daryl, and often accompanies the family to Bonnie Doon. Dale says goodbye. Bye, Dale. And the credits roll. That was The Castle. The Castle is a high bar to set for this series. Funny, charming, heartfelt. As we'll see in future episodes of Australia in Film, small fry character comedies set in the Melbourne suburbs have been one of the main exports of Australian media, and The Castle certainly helped popularise that. Sure, we had Home and Away before it, but 
nothing to quite this acclaim and recognition for being so unique to Australian characteristics. A pure passion project that would be the accompanying picture to a dictionary definition to Slice of Life, this story puts an Aussie spin on the classic underdog tale. And while not every story thread feels like it contributes to the central conflict, it certainly helps to give layers to the character and humble world of the Kerrigans. And what fantastic characters they are, and perfectly cast, especially Michael Caton as Daryl, Bud Tingwell as Lawrence, Anne Tenney as Sal, Costas Kilius as Farouk, and Tyrio Mora, I hope I'm saying that right, as Dennis. Very believable and very natural performances. The legal stuff may be a bit simplified, but is consistent as far as I can tell. The production it could have been resourced from each member of cast and crew and their relatives for all I know, such as the real-life Kerrigan's tow truck, but like their simplistic camera work, it only adds to the DIY blue-collar feel. If it works, it works. As for the comedy, it's hard to say what makes it so Australian. Probably the much celebrated working class element to Australia's culture, which other countries like Britain and America have also celebrated in comedies and dramas, but I think it's the sort of absurd collage of references to Aussie Bogan culture that skin this internationally relatable story. And how these charming little humorous elements give flavour to our characters, from Steve's crazy inventions to Daryl's cherished items in the pool room. Something you can piss yourself laughing along with. It's seriously hard to tell where the quotes end and the actual Aussie lingo begins. That's going straight to the pool room, how's the serenity, tell him he's dreaming, suffy in your jocks. It's like an archaeological dig. So, yeah, that's why the castle is so beloved in Australia. Fan service. Of the two films I've seen so far, The Castle is the best Australian movie ever made, followed closely by the story of the Kelly Gang. Yeah, it was a good idea to do the Australian movie considered best at, at number two, hey? This one feels like it should have been the finale, but I really wanted to talk about it. I really enjoyed watching this movie, so I'll try to find something really bad for the next episode to have a bit of fun. We've done the 1910s, we've done the 90s, we've got a lot of decades in between, and also the 2000s, 2010s, 2020s, who knows? Have a look at my semi-ranked list on Letterboxd that's catalogued all the movies I've watched so far. Yes, all two of them. Check out episode one of this series, The Story of the Kelly Gang, below, and stay tuned for the next one. Plus some more videos about other stuff on the way. We'll see you then. I'll miss you.